So it's a, it's a daunting task to talk about Jim, to talk about UCI, his intellectual legacy, um, you know, especially given the audience that we have today. And um, uh, I'm honored to have an opportunity to try. Uh, so thank you, Bill. Um, so let me start with my personal connection to Jim and to UCI. I, mean, I think it's that connection to UCI um, and to Jim it, it later, but much later than the beginning that, that makes us, uh, Martha and I at least, sort of be, be here getting a chance to talk to you. Um, as I said, I largely grew up in Irvine and moved from San Francisco in early elementary school. But by the time I, you know, really was uh, here, Jim had already left. He had, he had gone to Stanford. And so I first met him as an undergraduate at Stanford in 1988. I was 19 years old, and I took two of his incredibly popular classes, organizational decision making and organizational learning, so in my sophomore and then my junior year. He became my mentor, eventually my master's advisor um, for a sociology degree. And then I returned to Stanford for graduate school several years later, and he continued to be my trusted advisor and dissertation committee member. So he had a profound impact on me on, and my intellectual development, but I'm not alone. Right? I, I, uh, many of us are the beneficiary of Jim's influence. He's, he is an incredible and generous mentor to many, many people, and I feel very blessed. Um, so I had the unique pleasure of joining a UCI as a, a management school faculty member in 1999, now the business school. Uh, it was my first job after graduate school, so I was 30 years late. Um, but really, the, the imprint of Jim March was, and I think still is, very visible here. Um, and so what, what I would like to do in the time that I have is sort of build off of Martha's comments and talk about his intellectual legacy, uh, Jim's intellectual legacy, largely by focusing on some of the work he did after he left Irvine. And I hope in the later panels we'll get to see how it all, all connects. Um, it seems quite clear to me, um, you know, the connection between sort of my experience and the, the experiment at UCI. I've done a lot of work on imprinting, and I think there's two important imprints here. The imprint of Jim on UCI, the imprint of what happened here at UCI on the scholar and the person that Jim uh, was when, when I knew him at, at Stanford. Um, so I'm going to tell a series of little stories to try and sort of hopefully connect us with of what was happening here and, and what it was like to, to be a student and uh, uh, attend to his work. So let me start with his classes. Um, the, the first class, or both classes actually, they met at 8 a.m. in a very large, filled auditorium. At that point, it was in the education building. The class was cross-listed with political science, sociology, and business. And it drew MBA students from the business school and young undergraduates like me. Uh, and so you can immediately see Jim's continual interest and ability to speak to people across disciplinary space. Um, I also want to point out what it felt like to be a student of Jim, and I'm, I'm focusing on my experience mostly as an undergraduate, uh, because that's relatively unique in, 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 this, in this company. Um, he was accessible, he was informal, he was personal, <laughs> he was interested. Uh, and I have three examples, and we end with the wine. We don't start with the wine, but we'll end with the wine. Um, so in those auditorium-filled class, uh, classes, Jim took, had pictures taken of all of the students. Um, and they were on three-by-five cards with their names on one side and picture on the other. And um, I remember being stunned when in the lecture hall, I raised my hand and he called me by name. Um, now, I was not a student that sat in the front row. I did not ask a lot of questions. Um, for, and he didn't even ask us to sit in the same place every time, right? Uh, which is what I do with my MBA students to try and manage try getting to know their names. Since I sit here asking to you know, wear the same clothes every week would be sort of not <laughs> That certainly would help a lot, too. Um, so this class is both very large but very personal, right? And so there, there's this sort of... Uh, uh, tension there, I think a lot of, right, it's large but personal. So his meetings, so the second example, um, when you would go to meet with Jim at Stanford, uh, you would go to his office, um, there were chairs and there was a coffee table. His desk wasn't there, that was in some other space. So it was comfortable, it was welcoming, it was a place to talk about ideas, talk about life. Um, I had cried in his office more times than I care to admit, and he always had a Kleenex, you know, a tissue ready at hand. Um, <laughs> He made you feel like you, you know, he makes you feel like you have ideas worth having, um, and through his questioning, those ideas, you know, get better. Even if they're not good, they get better through the, the process of, of conversation. And so talking with Jim was both intellectually rigorous and playful. Right? It was fun. 
it was something that was, was great. Um, and then on Friday, um, Jim would ho host a, a wine on cheese hour. Um, so students, visiting faculty, uh, uh, faculty, we'd, we'd come, we'd interact, and it was a place for lots of informal sharing of ideas. And I don't actually remember as a 19-year-old whether I was encouraged to drink the wine, um, but he likes to often say that the best time to have children was while an undergraduate. Uh, so I think that, I, I doubt he was very conservative about the wine. The wine. <laughs> um, so I still have handwritten notes from all of those classes. You know, over the years I've gotten rid of many, many things, and I still have this folder with my notes from these two classes. And, and you know, when I look back at those notes, he talked about population ecology, and Harris and White, and sociological views of markets, bounded rationality, of course, and I found it mesmerizing. Right? And that really tells you something about Jim March as an educator. That I had, had not had an economics class, I had not had a sociology class, but he has this ability to take very abstract ideas and make them very, very accessible. Um, and he does this both as an educator and as a scholar, and he does it largely through metaphors and examples um, drawn from, from daily life. Right? He talks about parenting and marriage and relationships as a way to sort of talk about, talk about the world. And in fact, I'm currently supervising some staff members that are doing some cross-university partnerships. And you know, there's all these debates over who gets credit over what, and all these, these things happening. And I found myself um, on Wednesday actually just recounting one of Jim's adages, which is, a good marriage is one where each partner believes that they contribute more than 50%, <laughs> and they are OK with it. <laughs> and so that doesn't help right, in crafting the email to the a university partner, but it really sets a stage and establishes sort of what's the underlying principle that's going to motivate good collaboration. Um, so this this uh, connection between abstraction and and uh, and then these stories and the complexities and ambiguities of life um, that was really the essence of the organizational leadership class, which he taught I believe from 1980 to 1994, <coughs> and we read the great classics of literature: um, War and Peace, Othello, Saint Joan. A Don Quixote, um, and it was the best class I ever took. You know, it stayed with me for, for 25 years. And in this class, he would provide regular queries. This is one of the teaching methods for students to answer. And this is where we learn to think and to play with ideas. Um, and but he's old school. He doesn't like split infinitives and corrects your grammatical mistakes. So that's not going to be as accessible and informal with uncritical or easy. Right? And this is, this is very rigorous. Uh, uh, rigorous work. Um, but I want to share a query from one of the classes, um, just to give you a flavor of the class and, and another opportunity for a little bit of audience participation if you'd like. So uh, organizational leadership is a contradiction in terms. The essence of organizations is routine, conventional behavior tied to recognized standards of intelligence, morality, and legality. The essence of leadership, on the other hand, is escaping the routine, the standard, and the contemporary to implement a new morality, intelligence, and legality. Leaders confront organizations rather than build or serve them. Comment, drawing specific references from the reading and lectures in the course. So what kind of person right, that, that uh, asks these questions to, of their students? Right? Um, and any thoughts um, on this particular query? <laughs> this was actually the, uh, the final exam from um, my organization to class of 1989, and that is actually my my answer. So I can guarantee, I can show you that I actually did answer it. I'm go quickly by it so you can get actually. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, but uh, I did get an A in the class, but uh, it was a it was a it was a, a mind a mind blowing class. And what I like about this particular query is it demonstrates one of the themes of Jim the Educator and Jim the Scholar because he points out the essential tensions and dilemmas. He doesn't try and resolve them. He raises them, he explains them, how they're inherent in the world and the situation and the organization. And he makes you think about them. Um, and I think that's a really important essence of, of March as a person, as a mentor, as a, as a scholar. So and let me say a couple words um, about March as a scholar. His papers are also filled with wonderful stories and language, but they're also, they're simulation models. There, there's code and graphs and equations and tables. They are both um, highly abstract simulations, uh, but used to reveal and demonstrate 
the tensions and organizational life and really in life more generally. You know, my, my dad was a mathematician and I was used to math being used to sort of show black and white, right? But Jim uses it to show that there's black and white simultaneously, right? And, um, in, in a much different way than I've ever seen uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a student. And I think he does this in his teaching and he does this in his work where he takes these abstract ideas in a simulation model and connects it um, with these very vivid examples um, of, of, of life. So I think, it, you know, for me, it's, it's the elegance and it's the brilliance of the work. It, it's what allows ideas also to be used both by, you know, empirical quantitative scholars and by qualitative scholars examining the complexities and messiness of life. Because this work speaks to both audiences. Um, and that's really very, very unusual. And it's this sort of, uh, this sort of duality of the, the abstraction and the complexity that I think is very important. Um, and, and in his work itself, right, I mean, there's sort of the meta level um, duality, but I think you see it in a lot of his work. He talks about duality and unity. He talks about genius and madness or heresy. Um, and, and, and he talks about the logic of consequences, the logic of appropriateness. Um, and what I'm going to talk for a couple minutes about is sort of exploration and exploitation sort of in the organizational learning space, and a little bit about the people and practice that Martha also um, alluded to. So um, exploration and exploitation and organizational learning was published in Organization Science in 1991, so very late, uh, but a very good example of this work. There's also the myopia of learning with Dan Leventhal. So it's, it's a body of work. It's not a particular paper. I'm just using this as, as an example. Um, and uh, to, you know, uh, many of you I know will be familiar with it. So you know, behavioral theory, the firm, and organizations have over 30,000 citations each on Google Scholar. This has a mere 13,000. <laughs> All right. So so or, um, exploration and exploitation. Um, you know, these are very big terms used broadly, contrasting two very different types of behavior. Um, on the one hand, you have exploration, uh, which you know, is variance increasing, firms that are uh, exploring or engaging in broad search, experimentation, they're seeking radical innovation, um, often involves creating new markets, new products, um, being at the forefront or a pioneer in, in an area. And this strategy, of course, has risks because high variance means that firms can fail. But exploration, exploration is very important for setting out <coughs> new ideas and directions. Right? So you have that on the one hand. And exploitation, in contrast, is variance decreasing. These are firms that are exploiting or increasing efficiency, standardization, routinization, figuring out how to do what's been done before or what others have done faster, cheaper, better. And in this case, search tends to be local. Uh, emphasis is on implementation, refinement, incremental innovation, and the risk in exploiting is that you miss new opportunities or directions because the firm isn't searching as broadly, um, uh, but and, and so you can't um, adapt to change, environmental change, um, as easily. So the thing is that both are important. Um, organizations need both, but they have to make implicit and explicit choices between the two. Uh, exploration may require different processes, different structures, different strategies, different capabilities than um, exploitation. So there's a real tension between these ideas. And this fact, despite the fact that organizations need to do both, um, engaging in either one sort of leads to a sort of this self-reinforcing cycle, right, that we, that we know about, where feed, the feedback we get leads us to keep doing more of the same. Um, and so with exploitation, these are two of my favorite concepts, right? With exploitation, you have sort of the success or sort of the uh, competency trap where um, the returns to experience are such that firms get better by doing it. And so uh, this leads to a higher expected value in the short run for engaging in exploitative behavior, even if there's long-run advantages to doing something else. Uh, so the goal, this leads to this trap where firms get stuck in what may be a local rather than a, a more global option you could better off doing something else. So that's the, the competency trap. And then you have the failure trap, uh, or the, which is, is that um, the short run feedback you get from doing something new is often negative. And so it's only with time and practice that anything you start to do will pay off and, and start, start to be better. And so performance will improve them. But because the short run payoffs are negative, organizations keep shifting from one thing to another, looking for something um, 
but never sticking with anything long enough to become better uh, uh, and to obtain sort of high performance. So you've got these tensions both between exploration and exploitation and the organizational processes that reinforce um, sort of one or the other. Right? So that's, to me, this sort of speaks to the larger uh, dualities and tensions that I've been talking about. Another part of, of this 1991 paper that we don't talk about as much, um, but I think also speaks to another sort of commonality in Jim's work, is the sort of that you have individuals as members of these organizations. Right? The, the organization simulation set up so that there's a, a set of beliefs that the organization has, and the beliefs get updated through information gained by, by people. Um, right? There's people here, and this interaction between people and the organization. And the idea is that people learn the rules or beliefs of the organization more or less quickly, and uh, the organization learns uh, from the people. Right? There's people are learning from the organization, the organization is learning from the people, and to the extent that new members bring ideas that the organization doesn't have, that's good for the organization. Uh, you only learn from things that are different than what you know. And, and uh, so you don't want new individuals to be socialized very quickly because the organization doesn't learn from those people. People, of course, want to learn pretty quickly so they can fit in and sort of be part of the organization. And so another good tension, right, between what's good for the individual, what's good for the organization, what's good in the long run, what's good in the short run. Right? There's all these uh, returns that depend on time and space that are really important. Uh, and so and the model goes on and adds further complexity, but I think the simple example demonstrates the point of how people are part of the organization and the interplay between these two uh, being very important. So I'm going to end here and turn it over to Mark. And before I do, I thought I should end with uh, some of Jim's words. And this is from the preface to um, a book about this organizational leadership class that I've been talking about. Um, it's a, a great history of a book. But he sort of says, uh, there, you know, education is helping humans to consider ways to understand the essential dilemmas of human existence and the essential nature of the human <coughs> spirit. I think it's a elegant description of the role of education, especially in a time when we talk a lot about relevance, and so I think it's important for higher education more broadly. Right? And you know, the major lessons of leadership are really indistinguishable from the lessons uh, and issues of life. So, thank you very much.